Welcome, everyone. I'm Martha Minow. I'm the dean at Harvard Law School. Please take your seats. Uh, this is an uh, amazing panel here to talk about what may be one of the most important public policy issues in the United States. And what's fascinating is it's also one of the most important constitutional issues. This is a moment when public policy and constitutional law come together. We happen to have right here the most exquisite uh, and well prepared uh, panel. This event is brought to you courtesy of a partnership between the Petrie Flom Center here at the law school, which uh, addresses issues of health, health policy, uh, science, and the law, and also the Federalist Society. And we uh, are unbelievably lucky to have uh, Randy Barnett, who is, I think, the mastermind of the challenge to the constitutionality. Is that a fair thing to say, Randy? No. <laughs> but also uh, j just one of the most distinguished and thoughtful constitutional scholars in the country. Uh, and uh, Charles Freed, uh, who has uh, not only been Solicitor General of the United States, uh, longtime uh, teacher of constitutional law and jurisprudence, but also uh, a, a litigator um, in many, many cases uh, in the Supreme Court and an astute observer um, of these issues. And Larry Tribe, um, the author of the leading uh, treatise most cited on constitutional law in the world, um, and recently returned from Washington, D.C. Um, with his own perspectives. And uh, Glenn Cohen, who is uh, bringing life and animation to uh, health policy issues here at, at Harvard, and brings uh, philosophic uh, tools to bear to these issues as well. So no further ado, let the party roll. Thank you. So let me just give you a small sense of what's going to go on today, and then make two announcements. First, the two announcements. One, we've got sign-up sheets for the Petrie Flom Center floating around if you want to get information on our listserv and about us, and also up here on front. Second announcement, we'll take a five-minute pause, or not five-minute pause, we'll take a pause five minutes before one, because a number of students have to get to class just to let some shuffling go on, and then we'll go on. Now, if the dean wasn't here, I would say, this show is going to be so good, you should skip your next class. But because the dean is here, I'm just going to let that hang in the background as a possibility. Um, so here's the order of operations. Professor Barnett is going to speak first for 15 minutes. Uh, then Professor Freed uh, and Tribe are going to speak in that order for 10 minutes each. Then Professor Barnett's going to get a five-minute rebuttal. We have this as a quasi-debater-ish setup. We'll then shift to Q&A, which I'll moderate. OK, well, with no further ado, Professor Burnett. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's a pleasure to be back at Harvard Law School in the Ames Moot Courtroom. It's quite an honor, actually, to speak here. Uh, but let me begin my talk today with a thought experiment. Imagine that I tell you 100 things that you may not do tomorrow. Uh, you may not run on a treadmill, you may not eat broccoli, you may not buy a car, and 97 other specific things you may not do tomorrow. Now, while your liberty would certainly be restricted, there would still be an infinite number of things that you may still do. Now suppose, instead, that I tell you 100 things that you must do tomorrow. You must run on a treadmill, you must eat broccoli, you must buy a car, and 90 other, 97 other specific things. These 100 mandates, could potentially occupy all your time and consume all your money. So I hope that this little thought experiment illustrates why economic mandates are so much more onerous than either economic regulations or even economic prohibitions, and why so dangerous and unwritten constitutional power should not be implied among those that have been enumerated. In 2010, something happened in this country that has never happened before. Congress required that every person enter into a contractual relationship with a private company. Now, I realize that speakers come before you and make lots of factual claims that you're wise to be skeptical about. But I can prove to you that economic mandates like this one are unprecedented. Because if it had ever happened before, then each one of you would know all of the contracts the federal government requires you to make upon pain of a penalty exacted by the IRS. None of you can recite any such mandates, and neither could your parents or your grandparents, because this has never happened before. 
Now, it's not as though the federal government never requires you to do anything. You must register for the military and serve if called. You must submit a tax form, fill out a census form, and serve on a jury. And I've discovered since this whole controversy began, it turns out you must also serve on a posse if called upon to do so by a U.S. Marshal enforcing federal law. In case you didn't know that, you've got to do that. But the existence and nature of these very few duties illuminates the truly extraordinary and objectionable, objectionable nature of the individual insurance mandate. Each of these duties is necessary for the operation of government itself, and each has traditionally been widely recognized as inherent in being a citizen of the United States. Consider the military draft. In 1918, the Supreme Court rejected the claim that the military draft violates the 13th Amendment's bar on involuntary servitude by saying that it couldn't see how, quote, the exaction by the government from the citizen of the performance of his supreme and noble duty of contributing to the defense of the rights and honor of the nation could be said to be the imposition of involuntary servitude, unquote. But is it truly part of the supreme and noble duty of citizenship to do whatever Congress deems in its own discretion to be convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce? In essence, the mandate's defenders are, uh, claim that because Congress has the power to draft you into the military and make you fight and die, it has the power to make you do anything less than that, including mandating that you send your money to a private company and do business with it or another like it for the rest of your life. This simply does not follow. The greater does not include the lesser. Now, true, the Constitution does give Congress the power to impose taxes on the people and to compel them to give their money to the government for its support. And this has long been assumed. It's long been assumed that Congress can then appropriate funds to provide for the common defense and general welfare by making disbursements to private companies and individuals. Social Security and Medicare are examples of exercises of this tax and spending power. But when it divides the Affordable Care Act, the Senate declined to adopt a new taxing and spending scheme. To date, none of the five district court judges who have considered the constitutionality of the mandate, including the three judges who have upheld it as constitutional, have accepted the theory that it is justified under the tax power. Instead, each has examined whether the mandate is within the power of Congress um, under the Commerce Clause, quote, to regulate commerce among the several states, unquote, or whether under the Necessary and Proper Clause, the mandate is both, quote, necessary and proper for carrying into execution, carrying into execution, unquote, its commerce power. Nothing about the legal challenges or my talk today, I want you to know, turns on whether the mandate is within the original meaning of those enumerated powers. So don't confuse my stance as an originalist with my arguments today. The, the legal challenges that have been made up until today are based entirely on what existing Supreme Court doctrine has said about the scope of the Necessary and cl Proper Clause and the Commerce Clause. Now, of course, given the fact that economic mandates have never before been imposed on the American people by Congress, there can't possibly be any Supreme Court precedent directly upholding such a power. But during the New Deal, the Supreme Court used the Necessary and Proper Clause to allow Congress to go well beyond the regulation of interstate commerce, to reach wholly intrastate activities that are not themselves commerce, but which substantially affect interstate commerce. However, in 1995, in the case of United States versus Lopez, the court then limited the reach of this power to the regulation of economic rather than non-economic intrastate activity. Barring Congress from regulating non-economic intrastate activity keeps it from reaching activity that has only a remote connection to interstate commerce. Existing Commerce Clause and Necessary and, clause, necessary and Proper Clause doctrine, therefore, allows Congress to go this far the regulation of intrastate economic activity, and no farther. The individual mandate, however, goes beyond the regulation of economic activity to literally regulate inactivity. Rather than regulating or prohibiting economic activity in which a citizen voluntarily chooses to engage, Congress commanded that a citizen must engage in economic activity. It's as though the federal government mandated that Roscoe Filburn in Wickard v. Filburn must grow wheat, or that my client Angel Rach in Rach's case must grow marijuana. To try to stay within the existing doctrine allowing the, the regulation of economic activity, the government has been forced to offer a number of continually shifting arguments for why, despite the appearances, insurance mandates are regulating economic activity. The statute itself speaks of regulating decisions as though a decision 
is an action. But expanding the meaning of activity to include decisions not to act erases the distinction between acting and not acting. It would convert all your decisions not to sell your belongings into economic activity that could then be regulated or mandated if Congress deems it convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce. Indeed, in upholding the mandate, Judge Kessler helpfully clarified the unprecedented nature of the claim of power being inserted by the government. Quote, as previous Supreme Court cases have all involved physical activity, she wrote, as opposed to mental activity, that is, decision making, there is little judicial guidance on whether the latter falls within, the con within Congress's power. This is a judge upholding the act. And she then went on to assert, quote, it is pure semantics to argue that an individual who makes a choice to forego health insurance is not acting, especially given the serious con economic and health-related consequences to every individual choice, uh, to every individual of that choice, unquote. But just as the economic consequences of gun possession or gender-motivated violence do not convert non-economic activity into economic activity, and they did not in Lopez and Morrison, the economic consequences of failing to act does not convert inactivity into activity. Now in litigation, the government has also claimed that it is regulating the activity of obtaining health care, which it says everyone eventually will seek. And most recently, it has claimed that the minimum coverage provisions regulate the practice of obtaining health care services without insurance. However, had Congress tried to condition the activity of delivering or obtaining health care on patients having previously purchased insurance and denied people uh, uh, the ability to preserve their lives or from provide, by, by using their, to own, by using, denied people the opportunity to use their own funds to preserve their lives, it would have confronted serious due process clause objections along with, you know, nearly insuperable political ones. So the Affordable Care Act did not regulate the activity of obtaining health care. Had it done so, you could have avoided the duty to buy health insurance by avoiding the activity of obtaining health care. Instead, the bill requires everyone to obtain health insurance, regardless of whether they ever obtain health care services or not. Now, the fact that most Americans will seek health care at one point or another does not convert their failure to buy insurance into the regulation of economic activity. Finally, the government asserts that Congress may do anything that it deems necessary to a broader scheme of regulating interstate commerce, in this case, the regulation of insurance companies under the commerce power. But there is no such existing doctrine yet. The government's theory is based on a line of dictum in U.S. v. Lopez and a concurring opinion by Justice Antonin Scalia in, a two, in the 2005 medical marijuana case of Gonzalez v. Raich, where I did the moot court for that case here in this very room. Hopefully this case will come out better. <laughs> Whenever a majority of the Supreme Court eventually does decide to allow Congress to regulate non-economic activity because doing so is essential to a broader regulatory scheme, and I think they, they very well might, it will need to limit this doctrine, lest it lead to an unlimited power in Congress. So what limiting principle is offered by the government and the supporters of the mandate to this new claim of federal power under the Necessary and Proper Clause? Its main argument is that health care is somehow different than other types of goods and services. Because everyone will one day need health care and may not be able to afford it, and because emergency rooms are obligated by law to provide health care regardless of ability to pay, then it is said that to be necessary to require that all persons purchase health insurance today to avoid shifting costs to others tomorrow. But even assuming that this factual claim is accurate, it doesn't provide a constitutional principle if the Supreme Court upholds the power to impose insurance mandates on the people in the future, it will never evaluate the next use of economic mandates to see if circumstances in that case are similar to the ones to health care. Once the power to conscript Americans to enter into contractual relations with private companies is accepted here, it will be accepted any time Congress deems economic mandates to be convenient to the regulation of the national economy. So whenever defenders of the health insurance mandate sell, well, health care is different, one needs to then to ask them, yes, but what constitutional principle are you proposing for limiting this power? If their only reply at that point is the protection of liberty in the due process clause, then they are implicitly admitting that the enumerated powers themselves have no enforceable limit. On their account, Congress's power is as plenary as the police power of states 
which is also limited by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, or other constitutional rights. In other words, if the scope of the Congress's power is limited by the same limitations that limit states' power, then the scope of Congress's power is the same as state power, and that means Congress has a plenary police power, which the, a proposition which the Supreme Court has always denied. So look what's happening here. Congress exercises its commerce power to impose mandates on insurance companies and then claims these insurance company mandates will not have their desired effects unless it can also impose mandates on the people. By this reasoning, the Congress can prohibit, regulate, or mandate any activity it wills simply by adopting a broad regulatory scheme that won't work the way it likes unless it can then mandate any other form of private conduct it chooses. The textual flaw in this argument is that while restrictions on the interstate production, intrastate production of wheat or marijuana in Wickard and Raich, unlike those cases, the individual insurance mandate is not necessary to the execution for carrying into execution Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. Instead, it is necessary to ameliorate the successful execution of the regulatory scheme it imposes on insurance companies. And because allowing this reasoning would create a general discretionary power in Congress, the mandate does not, in the words of Chief Justice Marshall in McCulloch versus Maryland, consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. It is, therefore, improper. So are there five votes in the Supreme Court to extend Congress's power to include the imposition of economic mandates? Because Congress has never done anything like this before, the court doesn't have to strike down any other law that's ever been enacted in order to strike down the mandate. And that makes a challenge to the insurance mandate much more likely to succeed. If the act remains un as unpopular a year from now as it does today, I think justices will be receptive to limiting the scope of Congress's power under the necessary and proper clause um, to go beyond the and, and, re and, and pre pre preventing Congress from go beyond the regulation of interstate commerce to regulating uh, inactivity. In other words, they're going to draw the line at regulating activity. The distinction between acting and not acting is pervasive in all areas of law. We are liable for our actions, but absent some pre-existing duty, we cannot be penalized for our inaction. There is no supreme and noble duty of citizenship to enter into contracts with private companies when ordered by Congress to do so. For this reason, the power to impose economic mandates on the people is simply not within the limited and enumerated powers of Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barnett. I'll also mention that there are some seats up here in the front. I know that's like telling the students that's like telling Superman that you can have a kryptonite seat, but they're up there if you want them. Professor Freed. Thank you. Uh, Randy and I have been doing this now. This is the third time we've done it. Um, and every time I hear Randy, I am confused uh, whether his argument is a federalistic argument or a liberty argument, whether his argument is that somehow something is beyond the powers of Congress or whether it's beyond the powers of government. Because, of course, uh, uh, government is constantly mandating uh, that we do various things. And I think of Social Security, which is a tax. And Randy says, well, taxes are different. Uh, I'm not sure why they are different. But if it is a liberty argument, and I think that's what gets Randy his loudest applause lines, uh, that is something I'm going to uh, leave to my colleague Larry Tribe uh, to address. Well, is the health care mandate within uh, the powers granted to Congress under Article I, Section 8? The powers granted to par Congress include the power to regulate commerce. It is beyond question, and it was settled in 1944, that insurance is commerce. Insurance is commerce. That's the Southeast Underwriters case. Uh, it is also beyond question that health insurance, as a species of insurance, is surely commerce. Well, why then is not the mandate within that power? 
Uh, the only two cases since the 1930s in which the Supreme Court has said that Congress has gone too far in its invocation of the con uh, commerce power, and invocate, it says it's gone too far in num for a number of other reasons, but in its invocation of the commerce power are Morrison and Lopez. In Morrison, citing a desire to protect uh, the efficiency of labor, Congress had passed a law making it uh, an offense to beat up your girlfriend. In Lopez, citing the importance of having uh, uh, interstate investments, Congress made it a, uh, an offense to uh, carry a gun within the vicinity of a school. And what the court said in both those cases is, yes, but both of these are carrying a good joke too far. The connection between beating, be, beating up your girlfriend and protecting the la labor market is just too remote. At some point, the argument runs out. The healthcare mandate, however, is not in any sense remotely connected to Congress's uh, attempt to have a more or less universal scheme of insurance. Indeed, the egregious Judge Vinson of Florida acknowledged as much because in striking down the mandate, he also struck down the whole statute because he said, without the mandate, of course, the rest of it doesn't work. Well, uh, obviously, we are nowhere in the vicinity, nowhere in the vicinity of Morrison and Lopez. Well, the question is, uh, well, what about this activity inactivity line, which uh, my friend, colleague, and former student, uh, <laughs> to whom I taught torts, uh, uh, where inactivity really is an important point, good Samaritans and so on, uh, and, and perhaps the, the lesson stuck more than it should have. Uh, the, uh, uh, where does this come from, I wonder? Why is this activity-inactivity point so salient in the uh, two opinions which have struck this down? Uh, is it constitutional? Is it within the Constitution? Well, here I am sort of an originalist, sort of, because I don't go back all the way to the Constitution, but I'll go to John Marshall. John Marshall in Gibbons v. Ogden spoke regarding the Congress's commerce power, asked, what is the power? It is the power to regulate. That is, to prescribe the rule by which the commerce is to be governed. This power, like all others vested in Congress, is complete in itself and may be exercised to its utmost extent and acknowledges no limitations other than are prescribed in the Constitution. Well, there are limits prescribed in the Constitution and they all have to do with liberty to which uh, Larry will speak. But here is not the healthcare mandate the rule by which this aspect of commerce is governed. It is a rule for the government of the business of health insurance. Well, it's a rule which prescribes activity. It requires activity rather than, in, than inactivity. Indeed. And as uh, Randy will remember, so what? Uh, uh, liberty is a good so what, but Randy's not relying on that. I am relying on John Marshall. It is the power to make the rule which regulates the subject of commerce. This is such a rule. 
Now, it is indeed ironic. The reason we have the health care mandate is that uh, Congress was reluctant politically to have either socialized medicine in the form of a single payer, thank goodness, or uh, the government option. It was skittish on this. It wanted to keep this universal insurance within the private sector. And as Judge Vinson, the egregious Judge Vinson, recognized, I'll tell you why he's egregious later, uh, <laughs> uh, recognized without the health care mandate, the whole thing simply falls apart. So it is ironic that a device used to keep health care within the private sector is somehow viewed as an enormous assault on our liberties and so on. Uh, it is also worth considering that if Congress should decide, perhaps in the second Obama administration, to socialize not only health care, but let's say transportation and the manufacture of whatever it is, it's quite clear that the Commerce Clause and Congress and the Constitution would allow it. There would be no constitutional objection to it. Uh, our recourse would be elsewhere. Similarly, in this case, our recourse is elsewhere. And it is a deep confusion to find the recourse here in some imagined limitation on the commerce power which has no, uh, no anchor in any text nor in any precedent. The only anchor which Randy has been able to find is what I would call a skyhook. The anchor is in the lack of any precedent which involves uh, the regulation of inactivity. And again, my response is, so what? Uh, many things that Congress does for the first time have no precedent because they are being done for the first time. Uh, and uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Larry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Freed. Professor Tribe. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Charles, for referring to the second Obama administration. <laughs> uh, my friend and colleague and former student, Randy Barnett, <laughs> paints a dramatic picture of this as, as a, a violent takeover of individual lives. Uh, I don't have the excuse that Charles does. I didn't teach Randy torts. I purported to teach him constitutional law. <laughs> e evidently, evidently, something went wrong. <clears throat> uh, it's important to be clear about what the only seriously challenged provision of this act actually does. I mean, when you hear Randy say that this act is precedent for the government leaving you with no space in your life to make personal decisions, realize that the challenged provision creates an economic incentive in the form of a $750 per year increase in the federal income tax liability of those who do not comply uh, for individuals to purchase health insurance called minimum essential coverage uh, if they have taxable income and are not covered already by Medicare, Medicaid, the military, or their employers. That's all it does. It's only in that strictly financial sense that the individual mandate compels action or penalizes inaction. Uh, now, Randy talks about pure semantics. I submit it's pure semantics to describe the conduct that this mandate penalizes as a form of inaction. Decisions to remain uninsured and to just wait and see. Conduct of that form, remaining uninsured and waiting in a world where everybody eventually needs medical care uh, is in fact conduct that shifts costs to others. 
No one doubts that that directly undermines the operation of the law's guarantees that people uh, will not be discriminated against by regulated insurance companies because of pre-existing conditions or because of illness. Uh, so it is clear that conduct is being regulated, not simply an omission. That conduct ends up costing the country a great deal. In findings accompanying the Affordable Care Act, Congress determined that the cost of providing uncompensated care to the uninsured in 2008 totaled $43 billion. That's an average of $1,000 per year per family in higher premiums. So the decision to engage in a kind of gambling time shifting of costs to others uh, is a, an active form of conduct that Congress, as Charles, I think, has amply shown has adequate power uh, to regulate, either under the Commerce Clause alone or under the Commerce Clause coupled with the Necessary and Proper Clause uh, or simply uh, in the facilitation of Congress's power to raise taxes and to impose taxes for the uh, general welfare. Now let me engage in a thought experiment. Suppose Congress were to require anyone who obtained health care at public expense in the year 2010 and who could afford to purchase insurance in 2011, uh, to purchase such insurance in 2011, required anyone to purchase it or face a tax penalty if the person had already engaged in taking a free ride. I don't think even Randy would doubt that Congress had the power to do that, but the law Congress enacted does exactly that in a preventive way. It doesn't give a free bite at the apple. It doesn't wait for someone to engage in an instance of non-payment before imposing a tax penalty on opting out and undermining the system's viability. Now, whether you conceptualize a decision not to engage in a particular kind of economic transaction as an act or as an omission, it's clear that decisions of that kind, conduct of that kind, is every bit as subject to regulation under the Commerce Clause as a decision to, uh, to act in the most conventional sense. There is, of course, the famous case of farmer Philburn whose consumption of homegrown wheat was limited by Congress to compel him to consume wheat that had traveled in interstate commerce. The court in Wickard v. Filburn in 1942 described the law that it was unholding in just those terms, holding that Congress could validly, quote, restrict the extent to which one may forestall resort to the market by producing wheat to meet his own needs even if that forces some farmers into the market to buy wheat they could provide for themselves. Now, if you listen to Randy, you would think that Wickard was some sort of aberration or that maybe wheat is somehow uh, different, that there is no precedent for this. Uh, Charles says, so what? There's always a first time. I think that's a very good answer. Another answer is, you're wrong. There's plenty of precedent. <laughs> Congress, as early as 1790, penalized ship owners for failing to stock medications that their crews might later need without deduction from the wages of any sick seaman or marine. That was the first regulation of health enacted by Congress. Two years later, in 1792, Congress required every citizen potentially eligible to become a militiaman, and that's basically every able-bodied male over 18 in those days, quote, to provide himself with a good musket or firelock, a sufficient bayonet and belt and two spare flints, as well as a horse and uniform. Some forms of economic boycott, which are of course decisions not to purchase something from somebody, have been forbidden by federal antitrust law ever since 1890. And in 1964, in a couple of very justly famous decisions, the Supreme Court invoked the Commerce Clause to uphold federal laws compelling hotels and restaurants to serve people with whom they preferred not to deal. In the famous Heart of Atlanta case and the case of Ollie's Barbecue. These were mandates. They were not prohibitions. 
And Randy began talking by suggesting that there's a kind of analytically defensible distinction between the two because a list of prohibitions, however onerous, still leaves you with room to lead your life. Whereas in principle, a list of mandates could fill up your life. But that's not because one is a prohibition and the other is a mandate. It has to do with how pervasive and sweeping the substitution of private choice by public demand really is. It's not that mandates have a different impact on people from prohibitions. It's only a matter of semantics, whether you call something one or the other. There's no reason in the purposes of the Commerce Clause or in its history for drawing a action-inaction distinction. Uh, and I think Charles has clearly shown that even on a very strict reading of the word necessary in the necessary and proper clause, the kind of reading that Madison unsuccessfully argued for in, uh, in uh, that Maryland unsuccessfully argued for in McCulloch v. Maryland, uh, and that Madison and Jefferson urged uh, unsuccessfully against Hamilton uh, and Marshall, even under a very strict leading, this mandate would, uh, would qualify. Now, Randy says that the other mandates, like reporting for jury duty or registering for the draft or responding to the census, are different because those are intrinsic obligations of citizenship. Well, who says? Congress decides that this is a necessary part of good citizenship in 21st century America. It's not that the Constitution affirmatively authorized Congress to require people to show up for jury duty. It authorized Congress to create courts and the power to mandate showing up for jury duty is ancillary to that. It authorized Congress to raise armies and the mandate to register for a draft is ancillary to that. So it really is an objection about the invasion of liberty that Randy is talking about. It's not about federalism. And is there a real argument that the mandate to purchase health insurance or pay more taxes is an invasion of your liberty? You notice that Randy didn't directly invoke substantive due process, because if he did, it would be clear that that would be as much a restriction on states as on the national government. The reason that none of the challengers to this law say that it's an impermissible invasion of liberty is that that kind of argument wouldn't have flown even in the Lochner era of the late 1890s to 1934. Even in that era, the court upheld mandates to work on the roads in your community. In that era, the court even uphold, upheld compulsory vaccination because it was necessary. And this isn't the kind of invasion of the person that compulsory vaccination is. There may be a right in the unenumerated penumbras of the Bill of Rights or in the Liberty Clause, a right not to be forced to accept medical care you don't want, but there's no right to force the society to pay for your medical care by taking a free ride on the system. The kind of right that one would have to articulate here, a right to remain uninsured and to be a potential free rider, goes so far beyond what the most activist reading of the Ninth Amendment or of the Liberty Clause has ever proposed that I'm not surprised that Randy hasn't directly said that this is a speech in favor of libertarianism. Rick Hills calls it libertarianism light because it's not really a claim that no level of government has the power to impose this sort of mandate. But if you unwrap the logic, that's what it becomes. It becomes a claim that government cannot require on pain of a higher tax payment that one not take a free ride on a system that is a multi-trillion dollar industry. I think that reading of the liberty clauses of the 14th and 5th Amendment uh, is wholly indefensible uh, and I'm reasonably confident that the court will see it that way. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Tribe. Professor Barnett, your rebuttal. 
Well, I have to say that um, no matter how old you get, um, and I'm old enough now, now to, be on a, to be on a panel uh, at where you went to law school with two, not one, but two of your law school professors um, is a bit intimidating. Um, <laughs> And I would say that leading up to today, I was actually a little bit nervous, um, sort of like I was before I argued in the Supreme Court. Uh, however, since hearing uh, both of these presentations, uh, I've actually started to enjoy myself. <laughs> and it reminded me why both of them were such uh, wonderful professors, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, I, must have, I must be a great disappointment to them, <laughs> as they seem to have made painfully clear. <laughs> I think it's probably no accident that uh, I turned out differently than they expected and that I may have hold beliefs that they didn't teach me um, because, in fact, uh, for a very long time, law professors uh, taught after the New Deal that Congress essentially had a plenary power to do whatever it wanted with respect to the national economy, period, end of story. Um, the Commerce Clause, the power the, uh, co the co Congress clause gave Congress over interstate commerce when combined with the Necessary and Proper Clause and a, and a pretty selective reading of the Marshall opinions in Gibbons and McCulloch was thought to have given Congress a plenary power. So when Lopez was decided in 1995, that, was, that just shocked law professors and they just didn't believe that that had happened. They, they literally didn't believe it. They thought, well, all Congress would now have to do is to come up with some findings. And at that point, then the court would uh, see the light of day and they'd realize what we've been teaching all this time is Congress has a plenary power. Uh, and then when Morrison was decided, after a bunch of hearings that did involve a lot of findings, um, law professors were just really amazed and started to take the court seriously and thought, well, you know, well, maybe, maybe there is a limit to the enumerated powers under Article 1, Section 8, contrary to what we've been teaching for 60 years. Um, and then when Rach was decided, law professors were able to revert to their original understanding of the New Deal. Uh, and that is uh, that Congress once again had uh, an unlimited plenary power, and uh, the court would see. Th and the court has now backed off from the new federalism. And that, by the way, may well prove to be the correct uh, uh, description of what this Supreme Court will do and what this Supreme Court has done. It's possible that that will be the case. But if that happens, um, it will not be because of what the Supreme Court has said in the past. Because the law professor's understanding of what the New Deal established just does, is not true to the cases of themselves. And I just urge all of you to go back and reread those New Deal cases. Reread NLRB, reread uh, Darby, reread Wickard itself. You know, reread Southeastern Underwriters for that matter. Something, uh, that's a case that's not in anybody's casebook. It will be next time, next edition, but it wasn't this time. I reread Southeastern Underwriters with the sort of standard reading that. Uh, that is given to it, that, that Charles gave to it, that it said that insurance equals commerce. It never says insurance equals commerce. It seems to suggest it, but it doesn't actually say it. There's one footnote to a quote from Hamilton, which is very selectively quoted, which suggests that uh, insurance is commerce. But then if you go read the Hamilton quote, the only authority for this proposition, it, Hamilton is saying that in regulating navigation, Congress has the implied power to regulate lots of things, including articles of insurance, with respect to shipping as a means of regulating navigation. It never says commerce equals uh, insurance. Now, this is not an issue in this case. Because, because of Southeastern underwriters, as precedent, Congress does have the power to regulate the insurance companies under the Necessary and Proper Clause, apparently, if you read Southeastern underwriters, which relies on the substantial effects doctrine, among other things. So now we're said, we're told, that with this new power, this is also within the Congress's power to reach. Well, I mean, I've, I'm, I've exhausted my time. Um, uh, pretty much. But let me just end with this. Um, both my colleagues uh, have emphasized that liberty, that I'm, I seem to be making a liberty-based claim uh, and that liberty is what I care about. Well, I confess I do care about liberty and I, and I know both of, they do, that both of them do as well. Um, and so, yes, I am motivated by concerns of liberty. But limited government, the limited and enumerated power scheme that the founders put into the Constitution was an, uh, its objective was the protection of liberty, and it was defended as a protection of liberty. In fact, it was defended so arduously as a, def as a protection of liberty that it was argued that a Bill of Rights would be unnecessary because the enumerated power scheme would do all the work. Well, not if you read it the way law professors have read it since the New Deal, because the enumerated power scheme does no work whatsoever. If you listen very carefully to what both of my colleagues have said, they have told you that the enumerated power scheme gives Congress a plenary power over the national economy subject to only to the expressed um, uh, restrictions 
that are in the Constitution. That's not what the enumerated power scheme did. It's not what it does. And the Supreme Court has never said that that's what it did. And I don't believe they'll do so in this case. And if they did, then you, it would be the case that because the Congress has the power to draft you in the military and fight and die as part of what, it's called, what the Supreme Court has called the supreme and noble duty of citizenship, it will then be a part of the supreme and noble duty of citizenship to do whatever Congress deems in its own discretion to be convenient to its regulation of the national economy. And that would be a fundamental alteration in the status of American citizens. Thanks.